So, all right, we read this passage last week, and um, one thing we note with uh, Marlowe as he's talking about this, uh, pre prede his predecessor out there to get up to Kurtz, is uh, there, is a, there is quite a bit of humor in the book, and we see that. Here's, oh, it didn't surprise me in the least. Think about the tone. You know, sometimes, and this is one of the things interesting about Heart of Darkness is the tone sometimes will be coming at you straight on and direct, and then sometimes it'll be very ironic. He talks here, as, you know, uh, that Friesleben was, uh, no doubt he had been a couple of years already out there engaged in the noble cause. We talked about this last week, just the, the masking of the motives. We went into uh, the background on that. Tried to make it relevant as well in uh, the first lecture on uh, recent historical things closer to our time, such as Vietnam and the, the motives leading up to our invasion of Iraq in 2003. So um, it's one thing, you know, I'm trying to get you guys to do is to make some connections. Um, so the noble cause being that kind of masked motive they were all there, this, he's talking about the bones, he finds the guy's bones. They were all there, the supernatural being had not been touched. I think he's being kind of ironic there. It's, it's just this mortal man's bones, but to the natives apparently he's like some supernatural being. And he says, uh, calls it a glorious affair, the cause of progress. So the interesting thing, one thing I think that people really like about this book is that your narrator inside the frame narrative, of course, is Marlowe, is, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to kind of locate exactly where he's coming from at all times. You know, is, is he, I mean, he seems to be very skeptical of the motives of the company and, and the whole Belgian, uh, you know, uh, Leopold's colonization uh, enterprise down there. He seems to be, uh, you know, um, you know, puncturing a lot of those kind of lies that are kind of masking the real reasons for them being there. But at the same time, as we see to, in today's readings, we'll, we'll see how he actually becomes complicit and actually starts to cover up, not only for the company, but for Kurtz and what's happened there. So let's see how that happens. Oops, sorry. Um, one thing Marlowe says, this, and here, this is again in this edition here, I think we're on the same pages. He says, um, I undertook, amongst other things, not to disclose any trade secrets. Well, I'm not going to. He's going to bring this line up again later when things start to get really crazy. He'll say, yeah, I'm not disclosing any trade secrets here. Well, why not? Why is he protecting this, uh, com this company that was down there basically raping the, the jungle and, and uh, uh, responsible for what some historians believe is millions of uh, uh, people in decline in the population while they were there? So how is this utterance beginning to show Marlowe identifying with the company and its motives? You know, um, we talked about with Burke, one purpose of rhetoric being identification. Can you help but identify with something that you're a part of, even if you know it's not right? Okay, moving on. As, uh, let's go to page uh, 77. As Marlowe first starts to see the jungle, notice the point of view, the perspective, the camera angle, as it were. So Conrad has Marlowe describing it over there as like this mass of foliage. We, watching the coast as it slips by um, is like thinking about an enigma. And, well, that's very convenient. Okay, if you think about it all as an enigma, it makes it this kind of unsolvable problem. But to the natives living there, that jungle's not an enigma. You know, conceivably, it's, it's, they understand it. So by immediately qualifying it as an enigma, you create distance between yourself and the other and a sense of removal. And of course, it's easier to attack or exploit something that's seen as an other, something that you alienate from yourself, that something you disidentify with, is it's easier to exploit it or to go after it. You know, you can see, he says, there wasn't even a shed there. She was shelling the bush. Pop would go one of the gums. And it's, it's, there's an insanity to it. It's like they're just dumping these uh, uh, weapons into the, into the jungle for what? It, it seems kind of like a form of madness. Nothing could happen. There was a touch of insanity. Um, he talks about another report from the cliff 
made me think suddenly of that ship of war I'd seen firing into the continent. But these men could by no stretch of imagination be called enemies. You know, there's a whole rhetoric to labeling someone as a criminal, as an enemy. But here he sees kind of the hypocrisy. They were called criminals and the outraged law like the bursting shells had come to them. Um, and then notice the language here on page 81. Um, he says, I avoid, he finds this big hole just in the middle of a slope as he's walking into the first station uh, at the mouth of the river. And he says, I avoided a vast artificial hole somebody had been digging on the slope, the purpose of which I found it impossible to divine. This at the bottom of page 81. He says, it wasn't a quarry or sand pit anyhow, it was just a hole. So he says, it might have been connected with the philanthropic desire of giving the criminals something to do. So there's that tone again. Phil philanthropy, of course, is uh, charitable acts, right? So he's saying maybe someone was giving these natives something to do. That was an act of charity, philanthropy. All right, moving on. How does Marlowe try to uh, exculpate himself from what's been going on there? Well, he's so I feel like I was becoming scientifically interesting. Remember the uh, doctor who measured his skull when he was leaving and said, you know, science is going to be interested, things happen out there. He said, men out here should have no intros, the manager says. Basically, being a hollow person can take that out several ways. At the same time, we can juxtapose his complicity with his skepticism. Um, he says to the brick maker, this is at page 92, um, who is this Mr. Kurtz? Again, trying to identify who is Kurtz, what is this person? And, and then we hear he's an emissary of pity and science and progress and devil knows what else. We want for the guidance of the cause entrusted to us by Europe, higher intelligence, wide sympathies, a singleness of purpose. Which, of course, Kurtz has utterly corrupted any semblance of uh, adhering to those values with all the decapitated native heads around his hut and uh, um, then he uh, says at page 93 you guys know who Mephistopheles was yes in in uh, Goethe's Faust uh, Mephistopheles is the name of the, of the devil who uh, and of course Faust is a character who basically sells his soul to the devil um, so he says, I let him run on this paper mache, Mephistopheles, paper mache, again, kind of evoking this idea of being hollow, of having nothing inside. And it seemed to me that if I tried, I could, I should say, poke my forefinger through him, and I would find nothing inside but a little loose dirt, maybe. Um, and then this, this idea of being amid this kind of uh, mystery that you can't apprehend, what were we who had strayed in here? Could we handle that dumb thing or would it handle us? Um, so, question for you guys. If here, what would the jungle be a synecdoche of? Okay, think about that. What's the jungle represent? This, this dumb thing. And yes, you want to make a stab at that? We always refer to the jungle as darkness and as the lack of knowledge and as this sort of primitive place. So I think, if anything, it's, it's sort of the jungle of the synecdoche of a general human primal sort of take on life, which he, going down the river, at times he said, you know, I wish I could be them, but then he sort of comes back to his civilized viewpoint, which I think is interesting. Good. I, I like that. So this idea of there's this primordial mystery that we're a part of that is at the same time seems kind of unknowable, but we're still kind of maybe uh, descended out of that chaos. Um, so, uh, and the idea of uh, also order being kind of a construct comes forth as well. You know, the jungle for Marlowe represents a place of disorder, a place, you know, utterly opposed to civilization, you know, think, but it's just disorder and chaos because it's not European order. It's, it doesn't make sense to Marlowe. So, we talked last week about, in, in Burke's rhetoric, this idea of identifying that in any self-expression is an attempt to bridge the abyss between the self and the other because of that fear we have of being alone. And, and so Marlowe 
we see even before he meets Kurtz, he starts to consubstantiate with him, and consubstantiate using Burke's uh, verb there, meaning to basically essentially become one with, okay? And by the end of the book, as we're going to see today, he totally uh, has become basically a ventriloquist dummy for Kurtz, at the very least, I, I would argue. Uh, so he says, I seem to see Kurtz for the first time, the lone white man turning his back suddenly on the headquarters. The steamer, there's a big delay in getting this, the steamboat ready to be worthy to go back out. It's had some damage. He's waiting for some rivets. And it, it becomes almost this kind of absurd uh, trope in the b beginning of the book, this idea of the rivets. When are the rivets going to show up? And somewhere there's a lot of rivets, but not where he needs them. They, so eventually he's going to get the boat repaired, but there's this big delay. And uh, one night as he's up on top of the boat, which it's dark, and he hears some guys talking down below, and, and this whole scene goes on for several pages. Yes. Is this the scene of manager and Zuckle? Yes, and the, the, he calls him like the fat man, and the, so there's this conversation that we only get kind of cryptic little bits and pieces of, and it's, he's eavesdropping and, and getting little snippets, and so like most of this book, you know, the content's coming to us kind of through this veil of fog and mist and, you know, even the, the conversations that are overheard are we're just getting kind of little bits and it's, it's hard to get things to kind of cohere into uh, understandable whole meanings in this book. And this is represented here. And one, one of the things he hears that the people who are there in the company running things themselves know that it's all a sham. They know that it's all bogus. And here the mask actually slips. This is at the bottom of page 101, for you guys who are following with me. The extraordinary series of delays is not my fault. I did my best. The fat man sighed. Very sad. And the pestiferous absurdity of his talk, continued the other. He bothered me enough when he was here. Each station should be like a beacon on the road towards better things, a center for trade, of course, but also for humanizing, improving, instructing. Conceive you that ass. And, and he wants to be manager. So who, who are they quoting here? Who are they making fun of? Kurtz. Kurtz. So Kurtz goes down there with these kind of high-blown ideals of what the mission's going to be, and they're making fun of him and saying how ridiculous it was putting up with him. A sense of this kind of sublime inscrutability comes through again and again. We see that on page 103. He says something interesting here. It was the stillness of an implacable force brooding over an inscrutable intention, this jungle. And then he talks about how when he's, and at this point the steamboat's going up the river and he's struggling to nav, he's a good navigator and, and uh, pilot of the boat, but as as the boats, as he's navigating it up the river, it's very uh, precarious. There's, there's uh, hidden little logs and snags underneath that could gouge a, a hole right in the bottom of the boat and sink it. And so it's, it's uh, nerve wracking. And you can imagine if you're Marlowe trying to, you know, league after league up this river, you're trying to get the boat up there. You've got a lot of people on board and you don't want to just have it go down. Imagine a breakdown in the middle of that river. He's, he's in the middle of nowhere, literally. I mean, it would be a hideous situation. And so he's very nervous, just trying not to hit a rock or something that's hidden beneath the water. And so he says this, I had to keep a lookout for the signs of dead wood. This is right here on page 103. Um, signs of dead wood we could cut up in the night for the next day steaming. When you have to attend to things of that sort, to the mere incidents of the surface, the reality, the reality, I tell you, fades. The inner truth is hidden. So how is this Marlowe beginning to kind of excuse himself for disconnecting from what's right and what's real? And he starts to kind of say, yeah, well, with the, the situation I was dealing with, reality fades. Okay, and this is going to continue to be something he's going to expound on here um, at page 112. And of course, the, the natives who are going up on the boat with them have hippopotamus meat that they've brought with them. And that meat starts to rot, and, and, those, and those guys are still eating it, but he's smelling that old rotten meat smell. And he says, 
you can't breathe dead hippo waking, sleeping, and eating, and at the same time keep your precarious grip on existence. So it's almost like he's excusing himself for his mind kind of going into this other zone. And then, of course, he's got some of the natives there who are working as crew on the boat. And is, now, the other Europeans, of course, see these, uh, these dark-skinned peoples as lesser, a lesser species. And, you know, we've seen Marlowe use the N-word. Uh, we see him here exhibit that same kind of European uh, supremacist attitude in this passage on uh, page 106 where he says, in between whiles I had to look after the savage who was the fireman. That's the guy who's stoking the boiler for the steam engine. He was an improved specimen. He could fire up a vertical boiler. He was there below me, and upon my word to look at him was as edifying as seeing a dog in a parody of britches and a feather hat walking on its hind legs. So for him, even though he sees the, the hypocrisy and the wrongness of the company's exploits there, he himself is succumbing to a kind of supremacist attitude towards the native peoples. The reader, too, I, one thing about Conrad is he's going to involve us and mystify us as well in this idea of uh, making assumptions based on appearances. And, and at, at some point, we get kind of caught up in the surreal atmosphere. And so, for example, when the, out of the jungle, the natives, as, as they're getting closer to Kurtz, they start uh, shooting arrows at the steamboat. And uh, Marlowe kind of, at first, he just says, oh, there's just a bunch of little sticks flying around. Various things, of course, when he first sees the uh, heads that are on post outside of Kurtz's uh, dwelling, he says, little ornate carved balls on, the, on a balustrade or on a railing around the, the hut. Then he realizes those were actually human um, human skulls. So those are a couple ways you could see that the, uh, the book actually makes us jump to assumptions and leads us to make wrong judgments as we're reading. Absurd the idea of trying to use these Western weapons in this jungle. They just don't work. Um, the pilgrims start shooting their Winchester rifles into the jungle and he describes that as simply squirting lead into the bush. Um, we had the same problem in Vietnam, right? We went in there even with napalm, ended up losing that war. The, the um, jet strikes, and nothing seemed to, to help us to get a foothold on the uh, success there. And some would argue we had a similar outcome in, in Iraq, you know, where a lot of the uh, conventional Western ways of warfare didn't work against the roadside little booby traps and, and bombs that go off and um, not being able to bring the Western uh, way down there. He says he, he was looking forward to, I became aware I'd been looking forward to uh, talking with Mr. Kurtz, talking with, the, uh, and then he, he's flinging his bloody shoe overboard. He says, I'd been looking forward to a talk with Kurtz. I made a strange discovery that I had never imagined him as doing, you know, but as discoursing. I didn't say to myself, now I will never see him or now I will never shake him by the hand, but now I will never hear him. The man presented himself as a voice, and the clip we saw from Apocalypse Now, that's what the photojournalist is saying. You know, he's a voice, that voice. Um, not, of course, did I not connect him with some sort of action, but then we hear that was not the point. The point was in his being a gifted creature, and that all of his gifts, of all of them, the one that stood out preeminently, that carried with it a sense of real presence, was his ability to talk his words, the gift of expression, the bewildering, the illuminating, the most exalted and the most contemptible, the pulsating stream of light or the deceitful flow from the heart of an impenetrable darkness. It's bottom of 119, top of 120. Okay, uh, to me that's a key passage because Kurtz's gift, if it's a gift of voice and talking, isn't that a gift of rhetoric? How you, it's, is it, it's sometimes not what you say, but how you say it, right? And so the way Kurt is, is expressing himself is what is, a, is most impressive in Marlowe's opinion. And so you could see this almost as may, maybe Marlowe being seduced by Kurtz's rhetorical gifts. 
and to seeing that as a superior quality. What's the danger with that? If you start admiring someone for being such a great speaker, what's the danger with it? Hitler was a great speaker, wasn't he? Sometimes the, just the, the beauty of the person's ability to speak and move us, okay, that, that power can uh, end up in causing us to succumb to some really bad messaging and we can become seduced into some wrong-headed ideas. Does Heart of Darkness sort of bring out issues of um, moral relativism at all? This idea that sort of in the Congo it's different when in the Congo, when in the wilderness we can act differently. And is that sort of an aspect that Carl is trying to mask with his rhetoric? Or his you know, I would, first of all, I'd say everything uh, about Heart of Darkness is about relativism. You know, as we said, things don't co uh, cohere into kind of absolute black and white clarity. There's, it's, there's, yeah, you know, I mean, for Kurtz, and you, you sound like you've seen Apocalypse Now. Uh, yeah. So, you know, one of the, one of the questions is, in, 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 the, in Apocalypse Now, uh, Willard says, you know, they were calling this guy crazy they were calling him a murderer and crazy you know after they've been going out like dropping bombs on villages killing these women and children but yet he's the crazy one you know so uh they wouldn't they wouldn't let you write the f word on the side of your plane and that's the same plane you were going to use to drop napalm on a village but you couldn't write the f word on that plane so there's a lot of that kind of moral um squishiness i think hypocrisy. you know hypocrisy and, and relativism um, and, you know, again, it takes, goes back to appearances. So, key passage here. Um, so, how does Marlowe be begin to become this ventriloquist dummy for Marlowe? How, how does Kurtz, how, I mean, for Kurtz, how does Marlowe become this ventriloquist dummy for Kurtz? And we see it kind of happening in stages. He says, all Europe contributed to the making of Kurtz. Good line. So you could say that about any evil person, right? You could say, did all of Europe contribute to the making of Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin or to the Assad regime? Did all of the Middle East contribute or Western civilization? Uh, he said, by and by I learned that most appropriately the International Society for the Suppression of Savage Customs, that's quite a euphemism, had entrusted him with the making of a report and at the end of that moving appeal to every altruistic sentiment, it blazed at you, luminous and terrifying, like a flash of lightning in a serene sky, exterminate all the brutes. So there's this 17-page white paper, this, this big thesis that Kurtz wrote about the best way to deal with these savage customs. And it starts off with all these kind of altruistic, all, meaning well-meaning and, and charitable, uh, I, plans to do good for these peoples and at the end there's just this scrawl exterminate all the brutes so something happens from the, all the kind of euphemistic sugar-coated rhetoric in the first 16 pages and that scrawl on page 17 exterminate on the brutes and in Apocalypse Now they, uh, Mar the Marlowe character Willard finds a similar document by the Colonel Kurtz, and he ends up carrying it out with him um, as he's leaving at the end of the movie. And it, it doesn't say exterminate all the brutes, it just says drop the bomb, kill them all. So um, that's what you would say is maybe the mask slipping, and you're seeing the real motive there. And then he says, uh, page 123, as it turned out, I was to have the care of his memory. And to the, he goes back and reports to the company. So he comes out of the jungle with this report, right? And that's, that's basically supposedly going to have the answers of what happened up there. And what does he do with that report before he turns it into the company? Which, which part does he take off? He, he says, I tore off that last part and then turned it in. So why does he do that? Why does he cover for Kurtz turning into this sadistic kind of monster. I think that actually may be maybe a moment of self sort of introspection where he recognizes that maybe he had the capacity to do the same. Not only trying to 
keep Kurtz's name good in the world and, and, and maintain Kurtz's reputation, but he's also maybe recognizing that this is something that he could have done too. He doesn't want Kurtz to suffer the consequences of that. So he protects, protects Kurtz's reputation, right. so it becomes kind of the guardian of that memory. And yeah, jump in. And he also maybe feels that maybe Kurtz isn't the one at fault for kind of what happened to him, but the jungle and stuff. The jungle or how about the motives of the company? Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, how evil is the jungle? I mean, it's, it's just a different uh, environment, a different uh, civilization there, but it's seen as savage. And, you know, we talked about this in the first uh, lecture, you know, be, it's seen as savage and unholy. Well, they're not Christian. They don't worship, you know, the Christian God. They have these different customs. They don't dress like we do, you know. So they're savages, you know. We need to go in and fix them. We need to go tame them. and bring them the light of uh, salvation um, and of course the, the you know the thing is Kurtz is very very good at what the company really wants which is to extract more ivory and Kurtz is a genius at that um, but it doesn't make for good PR and it certainly doesn't make good for good PR when Kurtz writes just exterminate all the brutes you know to him they're just at that point probably in the way of him getting out every last bit of ivory and Marlowe describes what uh, Kurtz's camp looks like, right? There's, there's ivory everywhere. He says piles of it. And it's just, they've dug up and found all the ivory. They call it fossil ivory. Um, so let's uh, wrap up with a couple more slides. He says, uh, I turn mentally, this is that line for uh, page 138. Let's take a look at that. Um, he says, I turn mentally to Kurtz for relief, positively for relief. Nevertheless, I think Kurtz is a remarkable man, I said with emphasis. This is when he's reporting to the manager. He's turning in the report at the end. The manager started, dropped on me a cold, heavy glance, said very quietly, he was. And then he turned his back on me. My hour of favor was over. So at this point, Marlowe realizes he's kind of been lumped with Kurtz as being uh, something that's going to make the company look bad, right? And he says, uh, Kurtz was a partisan of methods for which the time was not ripe. I was unsound, but it was at least something to have a choice of nightmares. So he'd rather be lumped with Kurtz than, than stay in the company's own kind of uh, rhetorically masked nightmare. Because we have a sense that the company's still going to keep doing what it's doing. It just can't have Kurtz out there going rogue. And then uh, as we get closer to the end, he's, he's telling us again he did not betray Mr. Kurtz. He's going to be loyal to the end. This is why I said to you that I think he acts like a ventriloquist dummy. He's just kind of, at this point, Kurtz is dead, but he's Kurtz's mouthpiece. And he seems happy to do so, and, and happy to even lie to protect Kurtz's reputation. This is that consubstantiality I was talking about, where he's essentially become one with Kurtz. Okay. Um, Kurtz's last words are the horror, the horror. You could interpret this however you want. Um, is this the horror of the, of the jungle? Is this the horror of this, what's been done there? Is this the horror that's inside the European? that the jungle mirrors, you know, is the jungle just simply serving as a mirror of the horror that we carry within us, um, or all of those things, okay? It's a whisper. And then uh, Mr. Kurtz dies. Mr. Kurtz, he dead. And uh, Marlowe hands over the report. So then he goes to see Kurtz's intended, Kurtz's fiance. And some really interesting exchange happens here. And this is at page 152. Uh, we talked about consubstantiality, becoming one with the other. Here, literally, as Marlowe's uh, ringing the bell to, to meet this woman, he sees the reflection in the mahogany, the finish of the door. And what's the reflection he sees there? Does Marlowe see his own face? He literally sees Kurtz's face uh, staring at out of the glassy panel, stare with that wide and immense stare. 
and I seemed to hear the whispered cry, the horror, the horror. So if you wanted to argue that uh, the, through these rhetorical um, webs, we become consubstantial with the thing that we try to distance ourselves from, here it's ultimate complicity. You know, here Kurtz li literally is seen in the reflection. And then, of course, when he sees the fiancé, he tells her some. he says, intimacy grows out there. I knew him as well as it is possible for one man to know another. We talked about that, the idea of being afraid of this idea that it's never really possible to get 100% true knowledge of, of, a, of another person. Think of our most intimate family or friend, how much that person does not know about us and how much we don't know about them. It can be kind of terrifying how, how alone we are. But it says, out there, I knew him about as well as I knew anyone. And he lies to the fiance. She, she cajoles out of him. Uh, coerces him to say what his last words were. And of course, we know what Kurtz's last words were. The horror, the horror. But he says, oh, the last words were your name. So he, he lies to her. And, um, and the book ends. On the steamer, but then he crawled off and started crawling toward the tribe and the, the, like the medicine man's in the background. And Marlowe goes after him. And I'm just wondering, why does Marlowe even feel the need to he let the Russian go? Why does Marlowe feel the need to, to keep Kurtz in his sphere? Why does Marlowe, it's almost like Marlowe's extracting Kurtz, and why does that even need to happen? Why does Marlowe feel compelled to do that? It's kind of a question. That's a really good question. I mean, for me, Kurtz's presence up there at the head of the river is Marlowe's whole reason for going up there. And at that point, it's really Marlowe's whole reason for existence, you know, is going up there, finding out what happened, getting Kurtz, bringing him back. And, uh, and he's going to do it, you know. And along with that, I think we also see him really identify with Kurtz. So at this point, Kurtz is really kind of, Marlowe's kind of, uh, a big piece of Marlowe is now integrated with Kurtz. And not only, um, you know, in terms of identifying, but also in terms of the values. I mean, you say he doesn't think Kurtz is a great man, but I think he does in a lot of ways. You know, he, I think he respects Kurtz um, clarity of vision for seeing beyond all the rhetorical kind of um, euphemisms that have been used to kind of mask and cloak what's really going on there. And, uh, and you know, think about why is Marlowe telling the story to the other people on the Nelly there in the Thames? You know, why is he trying to draw them in? He's, he's saying, you know, look, this, we're all part of this thing, you know. And uh, and, you know, for him, I think Kurtz is, has been a, a person who's been able to kind of stare into that jungle and uh, make, you know, make, his, make a stand there that actually um, was significant. You know, Nietzsche said, you know, if you stare into the abyss long enough, it stares into you, you know. And uh, to me, I, I hear that, I think about this book, you know. And so, it's like not only has Marlowe gone into the jungle and seen the jungle staring back into him, but, but Kurtz is actually part of that jungle now at this point. Kurtz has become one with that. And, you know, one part of the book we haven't talked about is uh, the Kurtz's uh, apparent female, that, the native woman that's, uh, that's there. And, and she kind of seems to represent the jungle in kind of a female form. And, or, you know, you could look at it even maybe symbolically, you know, that maybe their connection represents his union with that mystery, you know, that there's a, because to me, if, if, what does she represent? She represents to me kind of the mystery of the jungle, you know, and, and so Kurtz has now attained intimacy with that. I also feel like she's just another example of how the Europeans view the natives there as objects. Like, uh, She's just with all the decorations. That, yeah, and like on the, for, for example, like on the, um, the boat, how, um, our protagonist described one of the um, the workers in the boat as just part of the machinery. Yeah. Like it, without any, I just feel like the way that the Europeans, their relationship with the natives there is just seeing them from more of an object point of view. Right. Yeah. And if you ob ob objectify something, of course, it's easier to take advantage of it. If you yeah. do it easier to uh, do these horrible things that they do to the natives there. Yeah. I watched a documentary on the uh, the civilization of the Congo. 
that was a really big part of it. So, so for um, Leopold and his minions to go in there and, and just, and, and remember last, in the last lecture we talked about, you know, historians kind of agree, it, probably at least two million people, uh, uh, the population declined by at least that many during those 20 years that Leopold had his colony there. I mean, uh, which was, a, yeah, it's a huge percentage of the population. So just think about the, what, what the atrocities that had to have happened, if that's true. And even like after that, like the Belgium like government like really kind of uh, censored a lot of like the documentation about what happened. Yeah, I so it kind of like resembles how like uh, um, how Marlowe kind of just censors like to exterminate the natives part. Right. Yeah. Makes for bad PR. <laughs> okay. Good. Good comments. On the west side, any comments over here? All right. So. Uh, we're making our way through the end of this book. Yes? What interest did Joseph Conrad have in writing this? He, he actually had a, been commissioned to pilot a steamboat up the Congo. So he had, uh, he had a similar experience. So uh, there's a lot of biography in, in the novel. Um, on Monday, I'm really looking forward to Monday. And, and it looks like we're going to be able to film on Monday. We're going to be um, going into the Hollow Men. And, and we're going to make a bridge between the Hollow Men, this novel, and the